That's it. Perfect. And the other bar is open. And oh, by the way, the other bar is open here too. And you can probably see the slides from there. <laughs> Although hearing it is more important. All right, so we have a, a, a panel that is our first panel. We have two panels today. One is a panel from the perspectives of the, the technologists from the, the, the ODP. I guess it's now called ODPI. I'm not that good with the names. ODPI? What's the I Little stand I. for? Little I. What's the I stand for? Because it's cool. Initiative? <laughs> Little I, big initiative. Yeah, OK. All right, cool. Um, and then the second panel is a customer panel uh, along with Merv. George will be back up as well. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking at Merv. The right panel, there. yeah, right. <laughs> so we got uh, Sean Conley is here. He's the Vice President of Corporate Strategy at Hortonworks, uh, longtime Cube guest. Pulled that nice shot of you on yeah, the Cube. Yeah, there you go. Uh, the Face first, for radio. Yeah, yeah, first year at the Warwick <laughs> Hotel. And uh, Mike Maxey, who does Corp Dev and Strategy for Pivotal, and also John Finelli, who's the Head of Marketing for Data Talk. So gentlemen, thanks very much. You know, welcome to the to the stage, to the, to the cube here at uh, Pillars 37. So Sean, I wonder if you can get us started. Uh, the sort of theme for this panel was the ODP perspective on the vision of the enterprise for the future. So I want to start with where we come from. You know, we've known each other for a while. We've seen this industry evolve very quickly. Where are we today in this whole Hadoop world? How would you describe it? So it's uh, a couple of different metrics. Interesting, and Arun Murthy actually, uh, I think, spoke at ApacheCon, and um, 2016 is, what, 10 years of Hadoop, right? So interesting that you know, 2005, 2006 is when uh, a lot of the Hadoop technology started. Um, you fast forward to today, and there's actually a very strong ecosystem of solutions around it. It's fundamental in a broader architecture. It's deployed on-prem and appliances in the cloud, um, and there's really a lot of innovation that ha is happening in and around open source, Apache Software Foundation, uh, new innovative e engines, um, both commercial and open source being applied to the data in the system. So I, I'd say, you know, um, strong litmus test of, you know, vibrancy around the, uh, um, you know, the evolution of it. Um, uh, you know, I think, uh, Interestingly, you know, uh, I, I see Merv Adrian, I think he's going to be up next. Merv and I see eye to eye on where things are from an adoption perspective is, you know, things are, uh, I think, progressive, progressing really well for uh, uh, Hadoop within the enterprise. Um, those deploying it, those looking to deploy uh, new solutions and things like that. So, um, you know, I think it's, uh, um, you know, working its way towards a data dial tone, so to speak. Uh, it still has a lot more work to do, but, um, you know, I think it's, it's very relevant. Uh, yeah, in so, so indirectly, I heard some of Merv's data or Gartner's data, I'm not sure. We just did a survey. It said 60% of the people we surveyed had Hadoop. I think I had heard a lower number. I heard, I heard somebody's interpretation. I don't know if it's an out-of-context interpretation that Gartner was saying Hadoop adoption was very slow. I don't know. Maybe you could comment. <laughs> yeah, down. What's your number? Is it 50, 60 percent? What are you guys saying? Our number is 44 percent of people are planning for or investing in Hadoop. Okay. General 44 percent planning or investing. So the, we did a survey 300. It was a little higher. You never know what these surveys yeah. are. You got to see. We just got the data. It's early. It and depends you, on who you survey. If you look at the sort of standard market adoption curve, that's um, right. you know in, well into the. Uh, early majority and, you know, where things begin to exercise themselves and stabilize, right, so. Okay, so you were talking about, this, you know, sort of this infrastructure tone. Um, the dial Mike, tone. the dial yeah. tone of infrastructure. But, so, Mike, I want to ask you, I don't know if George mentioned this in his talk, but he has this discussion, he always uses this line, is there's a, a slow motion collapse of infrastructure software pricing going on in the industry, and you guys, the infrastructure software companies, so sure. what do you do about that? How are you evolving up the chain, up the value. What, what's the mission given that you know, we're all sort of all aware of this? Yeah, I, I think there is a point. There, it is, prices are going down, I think is the way to think about it, but the demand is not. And the, the way you connect that up to the application is super important. So Pivotal, we do a lot of data. We also do cloud, we do agile, and we bring that together. And that's really where we're seeing value in a, lo a lot of the big enterprises. So being able to sort of connect it to that end application, I think George's slide around I think he called it Hadoop 3.0 or Big Data 3.0. was a pretty interesting take on that. I think, John, your, your architecture is similar to that. 
So we're seeing uh, lots of standardization at the bottom of the stack and more investment up stack, whether it be Spark, whether it be new projects coming in from particular vendors, or whether it be end users trying to build those applications all the well, way. Well, you guys are driving standardization at the bottom of the stack. Isn't that what ODP well, That's a big part of what we're trying to do, for sure. But I, I think we're it. also trying to make it easy to consume, right? To, to the 44% number, I think that uh, vendors have made money on management consoles for the last 10 years, but consumption's still not where it should be. Uh, super valuable tools in this stack and more and more showing up every day. And, and we feel that sort of standardizing at the lower layers allows innovation above. And that's a lot of what OB, ODPI is about. So John, do you have a perspective on, on, on why? Is it just so complicated? Sure. Um, so, um, you know, so we're uh, a unique position, right? So we sort of do a lot of end user customer facing things and we do a lot of distro facing things because we run on top of Hadoop as a YAR native app. And you know, the feeling that I'm getting from customers and, and what I hear from them is there's kind of three concerns that need to see addressed, right? So Hadoop was created by developers for developers, right? So as a, as a result, it's actually at its core very difficult. And as we try and take things to the enterprise, right, they want to be able to see that they can make it easier for the enterprise, not just for the developer, but for the DevOps guys, for the data scientist, and even the line of business guy. So the first problem is actually, can I build something? Can I build an app? And so then the second problem becomes, I built one, does anyone care, right? Because a lot of the Hadoop apps are just kind of repurposing or redoing things in their science projects. And so, this, so the second part is, can I make something that's interesting and get people excited? And if I fought through everything and I built this app and everybody loves it, can I operate it? Is it gonna fall over? Can I put it in my data center? Is it 24 seven? And so I think a lot of the work that we put in as a company and I think a lot of the direction that we're taking with ODPI is to really bring the ability for Hadoop and apps on Hadoop to be enterprise ready so they're easier to create, that they add value to the organization and they can be operationalized once you put them in production. On, the, on a uh, other note, so some of the, the when I view the drivers from an ODPI perspective, I view it from the lens of the ISV ecosystem and the enterprise from an adoption perspective. And the thing I've consistently heard, and whether it's Hadoop or other technologies, it's, it's very similar, is um, there's from ISVs who are trying to deploy into uh, variability of different um, permutations of Hadoop-based systems, it makes it uh, hard to get procured. Um, so they get held up in the procurement process because it's sort of, are you compatible or are you certified with this version of XYZ? So number one is removing that as an obstacle. Make it prescriptive on what it means to actually, you know, um, deploy into, uh, in a, into a compliant system. Because then that helps the enterprise actually focus more on the interesting part, which is, what solutions do I actually run, want to run on the platform and not get held up in this is incompatible or this doesn't work, right? So it's, you know, you start at the bottom and you start raising that bar of interoperability um, into other components. And I think, frankly, that's our, that needs to be our charter, right? So yeah. more solutions can come to bear to your point, right? Um, focus on the apps. How do you enable the apps? Well, we heard Mike Olson today say, you know, last year he made the bold prediction that Hadoop would disappear. Um, is that sort of your shared vision? To make Hadoop disappear? Make like storage invisible, like some people say, and infrastructure invisible? Or? So, um, you know, an a, um, analogy. So I've been with Hortonworks actually four years. Um, uh, we form, formed the partnership with Microsoft and Teradata at the time. So two, two very different reasons for investing in the Hadoop stack. But um, how I phrased the why we did the Microsoft partnership was, at the end of the day, I want Power BI Excel users or what that, the billion users in that ecosystem to tap into the value of data served up from a Hadoop platform and virtually be entirely oblivious that there's this yellow elephant behind the scenes. So if that is what you mean by making Hadoop disappear, then yeah, because it makes it seamless to consume and it actually enables them to use the tools, technologies, and other things that they're familiar yeah, with. I don't think you meant die. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> make it, it invisible. You know, it, it just <laughs> needs to be consumable for particular user communities, your SQL BI user community, your Scala you know, uh, developer community, your um, you know, Python. It should speak your language and it should be intuitive. So uh, we had a 
a little contest in the cube today. It's who, who said spark the most. Uh, I think IBM won, I'm pretty sure. Um, and so not surprising there. Uh, but uh, help us squint through the whole spark trend. Somebody joked this could, could be called, you know, spark world. Um, what's going on there? What's your point of view on it? Do you embrace Spark the same way that VMware embraces OpenStack? Do you, you know, have a different angle on that? Is it something that sort of fits in? I wonder if you could help us, you know, parse through that. Want to start? I, I just, I, I would add, the survey that we did so on streaming, uh, DataTorrent, by far the most popular data streaming platform, interestingly, ahead of Kafka, which is new, ahead of, you know, Spark streaming. So that was sort of testament to the work that you guys have done, which is not surprising because uh, you've done a lot of advanced work. But what about Spark? Where does it fit? I mean, everybody's talking about it. What do you guys say? So, um, you know, so from our approach, right, there is not going to be a one-size-fits-all for everyone, right? It doesn't work anyway in life that way. If you start to take one thing and stretch it for everything, you make certain design decisions that are trade-offs. And, you know, what we see, we expect in the future, as things, uh, as Hadoop becomes more standardized and, you know, there's Yarn and other activities that enterprises will run multiple processing paradigms. You might use Data Torrent for streaming, you might use Spark for batch, you might use something else for graphing. And so the idea is that the, the engines should all be compatible. And I think this idea of one doing everything is really almost sort of a desperation move of Hadoop's not moving, we're not seeing the adoption, it must be MapReduce is broken. We're going to all do Spark. And it's sort of like student body left. Sorry, my chair's moving. But everyone's sort of going that way, I guess except for me. Um, and so, you know, the whole idea of one platform, sorry, <laughs> that's actually going to do it all doesn't really make sense. And, and I think it's almost, you know, the emperor wears no clothes. Everybody's looking at Spark and saying, beautiful outfit. And I talk to people on the side. And again, there are use cases and, and Spark is, is good. I just worry about we overhype things as vendors and that sets expectations for enterprises that we're not ready for. And so I talk to a lot of people and they say, I'm using Spark. And I go, great, how long have you been in production? They go, well, not production, I'm just using it, right? And, and so we can't pin everything on one piece and we have to be honest with ourselves and I think, you know, even the Cloudera announcement that they were focusing on Spark, they said they were 50% there. That was the first time I heard somebody from a vendor kind of say where it actually sits. Guys, and nothing add? You don't want to touch that? Okay. Oh, no, I you agree. I, well, uh, I'll underscore a couple points. So, uh, Data Torrent, clearly you guys invested early on on being a yarn tenant in a Hadoop cluster. Um, from our perspective, Hadoop is a multi-workload platform, right? And so we need to enable all these different paradigms um, so you can uh, get value out of it, whether it's um, Spark for discovery and machine learning or, you know, Data Torrent for streaming, um, Hawk for uh, SQL access. I don't really care. I, all those engines need to be able to plug in cleanly in a way that's um, predictable. So the enterprise has the choice to light up whatever particular user base um, they have. And so there's a, from my perspective, uh, in this, uh, you know, in this market, I think there's a really interesting user community around um, Spark um, as that analytic engine uh, uh, within a Hadoop, um, uh, you know, context, and even outside of a Hadoop context. Um, it's able to get data from other data sources and others. So I like that, I like that from an application, application creation and enablement perspective. Um, so, so, but, you know, it's, uh, there's an embracement there. Um, it's, uh, it's a many strategy, not a one strategy, so, I guess. Is, so is I wonder if you could comment on this. When, when we talk to practitioners in our community, they, the, the big guys say we've invested a ton in Hadoop and we're not, we're not tossing it. You know, we're going to evolve it. There's a fat middle, though, that says, you know, we're, we're still trying to figure this stuff out. We don't have the resources. And, yeah, you know, we, we haven't invested a ton in Hadoop and we're, we're, we're looking at Spark, you know, seriously to try to figure out where that fits. Does that make sense to you? Is that what you're hearing? Um, I, I think there's a ton of innovation going on, whether it's Spark or within the ecosystem in general. What's hard is consumption and knowing when and how to place your bet. Can't hear me? How about now? That's a sound guy. Sound guy. 
Thank you. So uh, what I was saying is that there's a ton of innovation, whether you're talking Spark or really anywhere in big data. Uh, where we've seen it gets hard is consumption, right? And, and largely you rely on a vendor to help package it for you and hope that the vendor's making the right choice. But you know, a voice into how that gets consumed becomes harder and harder as more options show up and competing projects show up. And you know, I think as part of ODPI, our goal is to be opinionated um, and have an opinion that really addresses the industry by everybody weighing in on that opinion and making it easier for consumption. So that's really where we're focused and, and Spark's part of that. Um, as will be many other projects as we grow and expand. Well, and I mean, let's expand it out to, again, I, I like to think about enabling specific communities of users to actually use their tools and um, get value out of the data. So let's um, pick um, SaaS, the analytics company. There's a whole set of SaaS developers out there. They have the ability as a yarn tenant to run the SaaS engine native in Hadoop so that community of users can actually run their advanced math against data in Hadoop, right? Um, um, Spark community, same thing, right? Streaming around uh, technologies like data torrent and others, same thing. You, you kind of need to appeal to whatever the use case is, and whatever the right technology is. Um, the more users that can come to bear against the data to get value out of it, the better from my perspective. It isn't just whose engine's better, it's what's the use case it enables and um, how, how large is that population and does it help them? Yeah. All right. All right, I got a couple more questions and I, wanna, I want the audience to sort of think about some questions that you guys might have. So I, I, I want you to participate. So if you don't have questions, I'm gonna call on you. Um, the, I hear the guy in the back's gonna throw Skittles is what I yes, heard, yes. so they were okay. loaded up. So, so if you didn't like that question, I'm not even sure there's a question here, but I woke up this morning, I, hit up, I went on Silicon Angle, and we were reading the reviews of what happened on the Cube yesterday, and it was a quote by me that said... <laughs> Can you quote yourself? It was, it was a quote by me on Silicon Angle. They watched the live stream, and they put this up. They said, Volante says that the Duke ecosystem, big data ecosystem, is crowded, overfunded, profitless, but has a lot of potential. I was like, holy crap, I said that? I said, I'm going to really piss off a lot of my friends. Um, but... And I said, all right, what am I going to say here? There's a silver lining there. What is the silver lining? Okay, crowded, that means because it's big space, everybody jumps in. Overfunded, that's not necessarily a bad thing. That means that innovation can occur. Profitless maybe just means it's early, lots of potential. Um, but what but about you, that? You can actually make money. As a public, tr publicly traded company, uh, you can look at the Hortonworks financials in the Hadoop space. So um, there's revenue that comes in, but we definitely invest ahead of the curve in order to drive the tech forward. Um, well, you've got, you've to got enable those integrations and to enable the user communities, to enable the Microsoft ecosystem to tap in cleanly, et cetera, right? So, yeah, it's expensive. I mean, yeah. and, and you got, yeah. you're trying to go to a global footprint. So, um, but some comments. I mean, we had a lot of enthusiasm around this business. VCs poured in. Um, Still a good business? I mean, I know you're going to say yes, but what gives us confidence that this is actually going to live up to the potential that we've, or the promises that we've put forth? Comments, thoughts? I, I, I'd say yes, it's still a good business. Um, lots of money have showed up, right? And, and as you well know, I think your quote was pretty accurate. There's a lot, of, a lot of money pouring in, not a lot of money coming out. But I think that everybody's betting on the potential. And, you know, the, the folks that are started a lot of this are the big internet companies that are disrupting big enterprise. They're disintermediating their customers and they're becoming, you know, taxi services that don't own taxis, for example. And the investment that's happening now is the long payday. So I, I do think it is still a good investment. I do think that, to your point, it's buying a lot of innovation. Um, it's also changing the way companies behave. Um, we started as, you know, when Pivotal came out, we popped out of EMC and VMware. We had a pr all proprietary products for the most part. We're now pretty much an open source company, right? Everything's going open source, and we're not uh, doing that for shady reasons. We're really doing that because we think that's where innovation is, and that's where standards live. So some of the investment may not turn into dollars right away, but in the long run, it will show up. So really? in, go ahead. just a self-serving data point. Um, so, because some people go, how do you actually make money in the open source business, right? So um, who's the fastest company to 100 million in revenue. <laughs> Hortmarks. Um, Salesforce.com took five years. Um, we're on, uh, Barclays report was, we're on a four year trajectory, right? So 
the, the thing is, is that market area is moving quickly. There, there's value um, that makes a difference. Um, it's not just about shaving. You brought up the cost angle. Um, I think you can save money deploying Hadoop infrastructure. Um, if that's all you focus on, that's uninteresting. Yeah. Um, it's about the data discovery use cases. It's about this single view of whatever use cases. It's about the advanced predictive analytic use cases and real-time streaming use cases that actually make a fundamental difference in business outcomes. Um, and so I, you know, I have, I'm paid to be bullish, um, but I have to measure my comments from a public company perspective. But I, I think there's a lot of value delivery that is happening right in front of our eyes. And if you listen to a lot of the use cases, there's really a strong return on investment in um, rolling out these solutions. Well, I Sorry. think that, uh, go ahead. Sorry, John. I was gonna say, so, I mean, I think you raised the question of building a business and the idea of the funding coming through. So I think in some regards, the funding is enabling a lot of innovation with the, if we build it, we'll figure out the business model later. And that may work for one or two companies, but it's not gonna work for the ecosystem. And I mean, we recently joined the open source community with Apache Apex. If you guys haven't seen that, you should check it out. And you know, we built a business first being a proprietary company for two and a half years. We built an enterprise grade product. We have Fortune 10 companies running us that are generating value. Then we open sourced into the community a product that's 18 or 24 months ahead of what's already out there. So we built a business model. We built how we can sell software on top of that. And our open source isn't a, well, we're going to open source and, and you know, charge for support and services. We have a software company that's got a core open source technology that is taking off in the last 45 days as an Apache project. Okay. So there was a, a question? Yes. Good. She looked eager to ask, so I didn't want to overlook. I think, yes. uh, Mike Maxey um, will answer this question. <laughs> sure, that would be great. So Margaret Dawson, and I, this was not my question, but I'm with Red Hat, and so when you talk about an open source company that knows how to be profitable, you know, I would say that we are the best example. But I'm, I'm an ex-Red Hatter, too. Okay, there you Jay go. Jay Red Hat, yep. yes. So my question was actually kind of related to what you're all saying. Multiple engines, I'm hearing standards, uh, I'm hearing a mix of different things around simplicity and complexity. And I think that what is confusing is people throw around the word open and standards. And at the end of the day, enterprise IT needs integration, interoperability. Really. And I want to know what each of you is doing, not only to simplify big data solutions within either the Hadoop ecosystem or otherwise, but importantly, work with other shit because that's where the pain is right now. Excuse, excuse my French. Go ahead. That's a, that's what about a, that? I think that's a great question. I so, I, so I think we're going to change the ODPI tagline. Yeah. Work, work with shit better. Work with shit better. All right. So I think somebody tweeted that. Okay, so what about that? What are you guys doing ahead, to Mike. make this yeah, stuff better? I'll take a swag at that. I, I think, you know, it's kind of back to your consumption point, right? And, and everybody says open, and what does open mean, and those sorts of things. I mean... If you look at what we've built with ODPI, I'm going to go back to that because I think that was the point of the panel. Um, it, is pr it is extremely open. Anybody can join. Anybody can vote. Everybody weighs in. It's really a sounding board to build an opinion and make things easier. So uh, when we say open, we mean not only from developers, but companies and everybody else. But the deliverably out of that, and this will take time to do, but the de deliverable out of that will be a really simple certification program where... As a consumer, when you're buying a stack, because that's how people buy stuff these days, you'll know that everything in that stack all carries the same logo. It all works together. And it's not your job to put it together or to pay you know, the system integrators $400 an hour to put it together. It's, it works, and it's known, and it's, it's an easier model for consumption. So that's a big part of our goal, to make shit work. Exactly. And, th and that's why we have a range of folks folks who operate at the platform layer and how do you lay it down in a consistent way, right, um, across all vendors, to the uh, application and engine providers, to end customers, right, who are also building solutions on it. Because each one of those perspectives, frankly, helped shape some of the initial deliverables that we announced this week around what's the specification look like? What does compatibility and compliance mean for um, the uh, ISVs 
who need to deploy, from the platform vendors who are providing the substrate that they need to deploy into, um, what are all the knobs and dials and how should they be set by default to make that easier, right, and more predictable? And so, and then how do you actually have a test suite that asserts that scenario? And we have folks with on-prem solutions. We have AltaScale, who's a Hadoop as a service solution. They have the same desires. They want those workloads to just seamlessly drop in and run on their platform, right? They don't want the integration headache. They want the, the ease of um, interoperability, right? And so um, I think that's incumbent upon our efforts to deliver on that, right? Um, and that's what, frankly, every meeting I'm in, which we're in a lot of them, um, that's what we're measuring ourselves against. All right, Matt from Encapsa, you got a question? Okay, I'm, uh, I'm not from Red Hat, <laughs> but uh, I'm a small uh, uh, chief IP counsel from uh, a big data solutions company called Encapsa. And uh, you can consider me as the man off the street, like the layman, because I, you know, I don't have the gravitas or the understanding of everything that you guys are talking about, but I do understand some of the needs in the community particularly the healthcare industry. Uh, one of the big problems in the healthcare industry is that they have disparate databases that don't communicate with each other, okay? You have either IBM or SQL database here, Excel or something there. Two health systems want to combine, they can't, they have to hire a whole team of software engineers that spend millions of dollars, take millions of months to create a common field structure to combine this data so they can search patient A or patient B. Well, what can Hadoop or Spark do in this particular very, uh, I, I agree, a very uh, small, dedicated industry to um, uh, combine these data, this da these data from these databases so we don't have to deal with uh, database uh, software engineers and all the riffraff that we that uh, is costing hospitals tons of money. Um, it's just one very uh, particular uh, issue that's going on right now. Right. Thank you, Matt. At least you didn't ask him to solve the I, cancer I problem. Can hit that. John, you, want, you mentioned riffraff. You want to take oh, that one? <laughs> I'm not sure uh, how I should take that comment. Uh, I mean, that's yeah. that's some that's a heavy lift right yeah, there. So I, I just, I'll, I'll, I'll toss out a framework and we can uh, uh, expand on that. So, uh, one, I, I mentioned a variety of the common use cases that uh, Hadoop gets used for. One of them is the single view uh, use case. Um, and I was actually, uh, it's, it happens in the healthcare industry, it happens in retail. The pattern is very similar, where uh, Hadoop in many cases can act as the catch basin for data across those disparate systems. You can enrich it. Um, in your healthcare uh, scenario, it's not only about the existing data sets, but it might be about the new uh, patient sensor data, as well as other um, feeds and other data that, that are from new sources. Being able to get them in one spot where you can actually integrate them, aggregate them, join them in ways that you've never been able to do before, um, whether you use Spark or other uh, tools on Hadoop, it actually gives you a place where you could begin to make sense of from a 360 degree view, right, the value that's inherent in that data. That, that pattern's being applied across different industries, um, but that's, it's common, particularly in the uh, healthcare industry that I see. Yeah, I mean, just, just to pile on there, I think there was a presentation earlier today from a, one of our data scientists about healthcare and, and how they're doing predictive to figure out uh, when a heart attack victim shows up, when they'll check out, and it's, you know, saves lives and lots of dollars for healthcare, and it, it's flipping from predictive to, Am I looking up patient A or B in your example? So I think beyond sort of Sean's point of, hey, you can bring it together, you can actually start to do forward-looking systems of, uh, what was the term you so, used? In so the sort of intelligence. Right. Yeah. The sort of, you know, operational systems that you start to pull in play is you're pulling in live data from whether the person's at the doctor or at the hospital or you know, wearing their Fitbit, and then you want to supplement that with existing databases to then drive to an outcome. And you know, the ability to do that on Hadoop, whether it's with 
you know, uh, Apache Apex or DataTorrent or whatever, we have the ability to take in multiple data sources and combine them very rapidly because you can parallelize them. I think in the old days, the having these guys that are, you know, basically taking data files and merging them and creating data warehouses and building bigger files, and they're all sort of based on previous limitations. And those limitations don't exist anymore with the parallel processing and the inexpensive storage of Hadoop. Okay. So uh, how about I'm uh, kind of running a small uh, data analytics shop, uh, been in this space about 20 years. So I don't pretend to be expert in this, but uh, I have uh, two questions, hopefully simple. I mean, I guess one thing is, uh, if I remember right, I mean, those Hadoop uh, is coming from uh, two, basically, Dan was uh, writing it uh, following two Google papers. One is uh, for Google file system, another is MapReduce uh, par uh, paradigm, I mean those type of things. So essentially it's an open source solution of uh, parallel computing on commodity hardware. I mean if so open source is commodity ha software. So I guess coming from EE, there's a line that where you actually need to do parallel computing. So it's probably not everywhere. So second, I have a chance to go to uh, like uh, Ant Financial, which is uh, PayPal of uh, Alibaba, which is run a few times uh, higher volume than PayPal. Uh, I asked about them. I mean, basically, on the transaction-based data, they're still doing a lot of things on MySQL and other stuff. So I haven't really seen people talking about the marriage one day between the totally structured data and unstructured data. Hadoop is, it's, uh, it's coming, came from unstructured data. So where is the future? Where is, uh, what's going to happen? I mean, are you guys going to solve uh, structured data problem in the future? So uh, this is a softball handoff to the two of you, and I'll tee it up. So um, Hadoop evolved from MapReduce and HDFS to actually have the yarn layer, which enables MapReduce, it enables Spark, um, it enables uh, MPP SQL solutions, and it enables uh, streaming solutions to all run in a shared uh, infrastructure, right? So it, it started batch-oriented MapReduce, but it's evolved to a, actually multi-purpose, real-time, interactive um, data platform. Um, and so you certainly can store structured data in a Hadoop system using uh, technology like Hawk, uh, which is recently Apache, right? As well as other uh, SQL solutions yeah. and, and, the, and streaming from data torrent and other solutions uh, on, on the platform as well, simultaneously. Yeah. Right, so, go ahead. And I would say, you know, to Sean's point, it, it's super flexible today. I think it's always been advertised as that, but didn't always deliver that. Uh, but it's matured to a point where there's lots of solutions and, you know, SQL from many vendors and really nice streaming solutions. So I think it's delivering on that promise that was made, you know, 10 years ago when Hadoop was hatched of, hey, let's combine structured, non-structured and get value. So uh, there's plenty of examples over at the show. And, and, you know, I mentioned our data science team is doing that all the time. Uh, for SQL, we introduced Hawk, Apache Hawk uh, yesterday, I believe. So that's a nice SQL engine. There are many others available. Um, and then, you know, so I do believe it's there, but it took some time to get there. So, I mean, again, I, I think I would echo, you know, the whole idea of having a flexible platform. And again, for our perspective, Yarn is the way to go, is that enterprises will use the right tool for the right job, right? So, you know, we do a lot of data, uh, work on data in motion. And so you may want to do SQL queries on a data in a certain time period in the last hour and the two hours, but there's also going to always be a need to do SQL on you know, the last five years, the last three years, the last two years of data. So you want to be able to run you know, SQL on static data, and you want to be able to run analytics on your data in motion. And you want those both to be in the same place. So your data can be in motion, you can access that data, take action on that data, and then put it at rest for these ad hoc queries. So there's actually room for both. All right, we have to wrap. Thank you so much, Sean, Mike, John. Really appreciate it. And um, okay, quick Thank break. Thank you for that question. Right, great questions. You, you cursed. Quick, you quick break. We're going to do a switch. We have the customer panel coming up, and we're going to talk about building systems of intelligence, intelligence bringing those transaction and analytic systems together. Uh, so we'll be right back. Thanks, Mark.